This is Dana Hall. And uh, if you would bear with us, we have maybe as much as 15 minutes, perhaps less of aula related business to take care of before we turn it over to Dr. Lambert. Um, the primary item on our business agenda is that our bylaws require that 60 days before the June vote for new officers and new board members, we have to make the uh, nominations public. And so, Jim, I think you are the presenter of, as, as a member of the nominating committee, you're, you're the presenter of our nominees? Yes. And uh, I've talked with Ann, and she was very sorry. She said to say hello to everyone. And she was sorry she couldn't make the meeting tonight. But um, what I'd like to do is go through. Um, we are going to present a slate tonight for the June um, elections. And uh, I believe it has come up on your screen um, what that slate is. And I will go through it with, with you, with each person. Um, the slates for the candidates for the board of directors, it's the term of 2021 through 2024. And it would be Sue Guido, Gary Finch, Julie Lockhart, Ken Post, Ann Robeson, and Carl Weber. Those are the people that we're going to be presenting. There's a special election along with this that will be for filling uh, a couple other positions. Uh, in other words, the executive officer's positions. And Ann Robeson has very grac graciously, it's a huge commitment, has agreed to be president elect. What that is, is for two years, she'd be, well, she's filling out a, a one year term as president elect and then hopefully she comes in as president and then goes out as past president, but all are very effective positions. And uh, Eileen Berry has very graciously uh, and importantly has offered to fill Ann's position as recording secretary. Um, there's also part of the special election for to fill an open board of directors position, and that's uh, for one year. And that is uh, Dave Carr will be filling Bill Phillips position. Bill um, is, um, because of a lot of reasons, is not going to be on the board. Um, and he said to say hello to everyone. And uh, so that's kind of where we're at. Dave Carr very graciously has uh, agreed to go forward with that position and filling it for the year 2021 through 2022. Um, basically, that's what it is. We also can, up until the elections, um, support uh, if someone else wants to run against these people or uh, for the position, we still can open up the elections. And uh, if someone wants to know how to do that, we can go through that. Someone can give me a call or Ann uh, a call regarding that. Are there any questions out there? Boy, this is quiet. Is there anybody out there? Um, if not, then uh, that is what we as a, a board of directors are going to pre be presenting to our membership for uh, the election for June. Okay, thank you, Jim. Thanks for that uh, presentation for our bylaws. And then everyone, we just wanted to mention, we'll call them news items. Um, uh, one news item is, I think many of you are aware that uh, the Owasco watershed, as are probably all of the Finger Lake watersheds, is uh, infested with hemlock, woolly, adelgid, little tiny bugs. And um, 
we have, what I want to mention as news is we've hired, we, AULA, have hired two New York State certified insecticide applicators. They began work last week. Uh, we're hard on a job today. And um, uh, we, all of this is using donated money. AULA uh, donated as a starter pot of money, $25,000. And so for this spring campaign, we'll do as many of the guardian hemlocks as that money will permit. Um, on, on, and I should say on the sites that we looked at earlier this year, uh, some 17 different ravines and gullies and so forth, all of them on private property in Owasco water, in watershed. And when I mentioned guardian hemlocks, these are the ones that um, are holding the soil in place on the slopes of these ravines and gullies. And if we lose them, uh, we'll have a much, much bigger erosion problem and deterioration of water quality. So many other hemlocks are going to die. We're not treating those. We're just trying to save the ones that are considered to be critical to protecting the watershed. So that work is underway. And um, Jim, I think you wanted to mention uh, the good news about the sluiceway, as we all call it, up at the north end of Owasco Lake. Yes, and thank you, Dana. Uh, other than the name Sluiceway, we've got to come up with a better name for that. But anyway, the Sluiceway, which is the opening uh, at the north end of the lake where the pier goes out, there's always, there used to be an opening so that the water would come down and instead of just going around in circles, would go right out into the outlet. Uh, that has been plugged. We have been trying to unplug that for four or five years. Uh, we thought it was going to be a simple process, and it ended up being, it was impacted in a 38, I think it's a 38-inch pipe, uh, which is almost as solid as concrete because of zebra mussels and sand. So we've been trying to unplug it. We finally, uh, we used or the, the county and the city of Auburn uh, was doing some work on the, on the pipes. We used that same firm and were able to unplug just last Tuesday or Monday uh, that pipe that's 38 inches uh, in diameter. There literally were, di there was a diver in there doing this by hand in total blackness and couldn't see a thing in there, having to hand dig it because they could not route rotor rooter it out. So he was in there and he felt finally, after I think it was a week, week of work, um, was able to break through. And that is the situation. So that's very good. The only problem we still have is that we've got to figure out how to keep it from getting plugged again. And um, we're, um, they're working very hard on that. But uh, I got a call from Ed Wagner from Owasco letting me know that that had happened and um, a number of other people and uh, Seth Jensen's been very involved in the, and also the county. So that's kind of where all that stands. Are there any questions regarding the sluiceway? Any suggestions for a new name for it? <laughs> okay, Dana, that's that's it. Okay, so those were our two news items, everyone. And um, if there are, there are no questions, I'll introduce Dr. Lambert, Hillary Lambert. And Hillary, I have uh, your bio in front of me, so I'm just gonna touch on a few of the high points. Um, she has a stellar uh, multifaceted career and background. Since 2009, Dr. Lambert has been the steward and executive director of the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network. Um, she's a Tompkins County native from the town of Dryden, um, has a water resources focused PhD in geography, and um, has taught at several universities, edited a geographic magazine, uh, worked for a Kentucky based watershed protection organization was a cave explorer, is a mom and a grandmother, 
and a longtime science-based advocate for the environment. So Hillary, um, we much appreciate you and your assistant um, uh, tonight and over to you. Oh, uh, before, you, before you man the mic, everyone, as you have questions to ask Hillary, please use the uh, chat feature, which is down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Put your question in there and, and uh, then we'll, I'm sure, get to all of them after Hillary's talk. So without further ado, over to you, Hillary. Thank you. Um, and that's Jen Tefano there. Uh, she's our uh, program associate and we, she and I work as a very close team. Uh, Cube Lake Watershed Network is, a, 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 we do a bit of research. We don't do much policy. We do a lot of lake advocacy. We have a whole bunch of, as you do, um, small um, volunteer-based water sampling groups and drill hunters as I'm going to share with you. And then of course, since 2018, a massive um, lake-wide harmful algal blooms um, monitoring effort that we do with the Community Science Institute with their water lab in Ithaca. And we do a lot of other things. And um, I've been executive director since 2009. I'm talking to you from my actual childhood home in Dryden, to which I returned in 2009. And um, Hydrilla <laughs> has been part of my job. And when Jen joined me, her job as well, part of my job since 2011. So it's a 10 year saga that I'd like to tell you about. And um, you know, I thought, well, am I going to give them one of those crisp, fabulous DEC style um, presentations? And I realized, no, this is a little bit more um, soulful than that, because, you know, what I want to talk to you about is the amazing way people came together with almost really no funding in a, in a serious way. Um, to try to deal with something that was almost invisible, like a needle in the haystack of the giant lake that is Cuba Lake. And um, I think for a few years, we were kind of a cult because we would meet each month, you know, and um, particularly in the years, as I'm going to tell you about Bob Johnson, our main scientist, who was hunting for tubers on Cuyuga Inlet and Fall Creek and, you know, he'd come in and say, you know, found 500 per square, this and that. We'd all shudder and moan. And then there would be a season of treatment and he'd come back and say, we're down to 32 tubers. And then I couldn't find one. And for a while, we felt like we'd won the fight, you know. So, uh, so and the story has an arc, you know, of finding it, dealing with it, everybody battling it, looking like we conquered it. And now, now we're back in dealing with emerging hydrilla in several places along the lake. So Jen um, is going to help me here uh, by sharing uh, the PowerPoint that I've prepared. So take it away, Jen. Yep, the 10 year saga. I, I also said that thought that I might have time to talk about other water protection challenges, but we'll, we'll see how the time goes. But I do know that some people would like to talk about um, manure spills and I'm happy to do that tonight or any old time. So um, this is our um, logo with mission statement and motto. It takes a network to protect a watershed. We've been around since around 1998 as a 501c3. Uh, we have a board, membership, website, social media, all of the stuff. Um, yep, that's, that's our watershed. Um, sorry, we're hogging the center of the screen there, but you guys are, are in this, on this map. This is prepared, this beautiful map was prepared for us by the Community Science Institute about 10 years ago. And, you know, each of the greens, displays a different creek. So it's uh, a nice way to uh, convey the idea of a watershed. You, you all know the, you know, the big creeks down at the south end, the ones that are iconic with their waterfalls, 
Um, but there's um, the hundreds of straight creeks and several large creeks uh, all the way around the lake. Okay, Jen, and probably one way or another, you are all probably, as boaters, more familiar with Cuga Lake than I am because I'm a, I'm a creek girl. I live up across the road from Fall Creek in Dryden and I'm, I'm decidedly a Uplands Creek person, not, not, a, not a lake focused person. Um, but we, we are concerned with, as are you, the health of the lake and of the creeks and streams and wetlands and so on that, that drain to it. And these are, so, okay, I'll start my story. Thanks, Jen. Um, Hydrilla was first identified by a, a high school intern on what was then the floating classroom, the handle, the Cuga Lake floating classroom in 2011. And, uh, you know, she looked at it and said, hmm, this doesn't look like the native Elodia. And sure enough, when Bob Johnson had a look at it, he said, uh-oh. And um, it turned out that uh, about 166 acres in Cuga Inlet were infested. And I mean infested because I remember after hearing this, I walked out onto that little dock there at the, at the farmer's market where everybody's uh, eating their food. And looking into the water, you could see it was filled with these kind of murky plants all the way up to the surface. Ah, eh, was hydrilla. And everybody, I guess, just assumed that it was not something else. But that, that caused um, instant, enormous and wonderful reaction from the water-focused and environmental community in Ithaca, at Cornell, in the public agencies, the state agencies, and the county agencies. Okay, Jen, on to the next slide. Um, we reached out to experts in um, California and Florida, especially who have been dealing with hydrilla for a long time. And this is, um, you know, a list you've probably seen by now as to why hydrilla is, is not a good thing, ecological impacts and economic impacts. And we very quickly conveyed to the town of Ithaca and to the county agencies and then turned our eyes to DEC and the state for funding to do something about it quickly because uh, uh, one of the leaders, Roxy Johnston, also with me at the Ithaca Farmers Market, pointed out where all those people out there were paddling and boats were going back and forth. And she said, if we don't do anything about it, that waterway there will be choked to the surface with hydrilla and we will have to mow lanes in it for boat travel like they do in Florida. And at that point, I realized, oh, this is a very serious matter. Um, okay, Jen. Oh, one of those. That's right. That's what it looked like, see, the, that first summer. And then this is what it looks like in Florida if you let it go. Okay. Next slide. And then um, this, this is a wonderful uh, slide, Jen. I think you can poke, poke it again so that the, yes. We, what we were concerned about also was Cuba Lake was and remains the only lake in the Finger Lakes that has hydrilla. We're very proud of that. And that's because so many of people have worked so hard with the Finger Lakes Institute, Finger Lakes Prism, DEC, and all of you other lake groups through the Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance to keep it from spreading by passing laws, by requiring boat cleaning, having boat stewards and so on. But this was the concern was suddenly, suddenly we, this little pulled together group at the south end of Cuga Lake felt kind of responsible for um, keeping, keeping it where, where we had it and doing something about it so that it didn't go any further. Okay, Jen, next slide. Yeah, and this is another uh, photo of what happens in Florida. I mean, I mean, many of you have been there. You probably by now you know that what you're looking at is hydrilla on those beautiful lakes that seem romantically choked with greenery. And, you know, Florida, which is what we learned in long, it was conference calls back then, in those olden times, um, long calls with the experts uh, from other states who had been dealing with this since, you know, the 50s and 60s in some cases. Um, 
that Florida was spending, oh, I think the number was something like 18 million a year just to try to maintain it. And every once in a while they would, you know, herbicide the heck out of a water body to try to make it accessible again, but mostly they mowed and kept kept it clean uh, in limited kept um, lanes like that there uh, available for boating. California, on the other hand, um, and this is the role model we took, um, went for eradication. And so um, in their crazed California way, they, um, you know, they shut down a water body when it's found to have hydrilla in it. They, they just say, sorry, and close it down. They don't negotiate. And um, they, I, I remember the, the California expert on the phone saying, you guys are way behind. He said, you got to hurry. It was terrifying. <laughs> you can see why we became a cult. Next slide, please. And so we created a south end, south end of Cuba Lake Hydrilla Task Force. And we looked at different treatment options. Um, you know, there's, there's several that can be used on small water bodies that don't involve chemicals. And those are like the benthic mats that have been used to some extent in this situation or getting divers down who can extricate the tubers. We tried that and even with netting, um, they broke up and floated away, which, you know, just means they're going to go, tubers are being the root systems, and they're just going to float away, and tiny little fragment will take root someplace else. And um, as I said, we, we went for the eradicate, not the manage model. We looked to the state for emergency funding to do something in 2011 and 2012, and the state yielded funds for chemical treatments. And so even though Ithaca is a decidedly, um, well, it's a town that's, you know, has antipathy to chemical use, um, they understood. We presented the problem clearly enough that the public said, okay, give it a try. And um, um, yep, okay. And a secondary challenge, and that's these photos here, was to inform the public. And, uh, you know, you see that boat trailer down there draped with stuff. And um, the gentleman on the left in a cartoon that I got from a friend dealing with a boat uh, draped with stuff. A lot of fisher folk um, believe that hydrill is great for fish. And so, you, you know, you're dealing with that attitude and sense as well. Um, and yes, it is a, for a year or two. But once it gets so dense, it will grow to fill a 30 foot deep water body from bottom to top. Fish can't swim in it, turtles can't swim in it, people sure can't, boats, boats have trouble. So, um, you know, the, the, we had to develop a message and tools very quickly to get out to the public around the lake and between all the lakes. Um, that you had to start doing something about cleaning your trailers and um, making sure that, you know, your boat was clean before it went in the water and that you cleaned it after you got out of the water. And it took a lot of time to do that. Um, and, you know, at the beginning, it was us, our, our little organization, working with Sharon Anderson at Cornell Cooperative Extension, Tompkins County, and some input from DEC experts and local hydrilla expert Bob Johnson and the fabulous leadership of Roxy Johnston from the city of Ithaca and others who, who were doing this. We didn't have Hillary Mosher yet. We didn't have the Finger Lakes prism and uh, not a lot of expertise from Finger Lakes Institute. We did start sharing information immediately among all the lakes via the Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance as soon as it came along. But, you know, it was, um, it was an interesting um, situation to be in. So we kind of had to make up some things as we went along. And from the very first public outreach, which was our role, Hugh Lake Watershed Network's role, was desperately underfunded. And I'm really grateful to Finger Lakes Institute, to Tompkins County Soil and Water, and a couple of um, local funders for helping us kind of limp along 
on on sometimes we had as little as 3000 a year that we could use to justify saying we need to stay in the hydrilla game um because a curse was laid on us you know um california said this may take you seven to 10 years to eradicate from the Ithaca area. And during that entire time, you have to keep the population concerned, engaged, and aware, and the experts concerned and, and engaged and aware so that they will fund you and continue to support you. And that's a, you know, that's a heavy, heavy message. So next slide, please. Okay, that's Roxy Johnston, City of Ithaca. Um, who's a watersheds coordinator for the city of Ithaca, but there's not many of those. And that's Bill Foster on the right, head of the floating classroom today in a beautiful new ship vessel called Discover Cayuga Lake. Also Sharon Anderson, John Negley, and Angel Hinnickel of Tompkins County Soil and Water. A lot of people at Tompkins County Department of Health, state parks, and many other people formed our initial team at the South End to work on outreach, monitoring, management, treatment. Next slide. And that there's Bob Johnson, uh, longtime employee at Cornell. Uh, thank goodness, turned out to be a aquatic um, plant specialist who knew a lot about hydrilla. So he became the guy that everybody took their samples to and said, is this it, is this it? And he, um, with the help and advice and support of a lot of people, set up an annual monitoring um, um, tool in which he and a team went out and surveyed the southern chunk of the lake every single summer um, to ascertain what are the impacts from the chemicals being used, minimal to none. Um, it's a long-term outcome um and to you know do on a grid survey across the southern end of the lake looking for hydrilla and up into the creeks so his reports are available online and he's he's still doing it next slide please and i'm not giving you the latest um info uh treatment met plan maps charts this one's from 2016 i just happened to have it handy when I was putting this together because we've been looking at about the same area since 2011. That's Stewart Park there um, in about 2015, 2016, a line of cute little healthy hydrilla plants, 19 of them, was found right off the shoreline of Stewart Park. And then a couple of plants popped up over there by the um, Merrill Sailing Center. Um, next slide please and so these are the um the treatment plans that were put together every year uh from 20 well they're still going on what do i mean from 20, 2012 on that's cayuga inlet with adjoining waterways um determining you know which which chemical was going to be used where and for how long it turned out over time that the most effective tool was uh, fluoridone, which is a granular systemic herbicide, and it can be used, you know, on a one-time basis, or they had um, long-term um, drip facilities set up for several years. Um, and, uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, and Bob Johnson's monitoring, as I mentioned, and I do want to stress this, that determined that non hydrilla species were not in any, well, I mean, maybe you could find a tiny fraction of impact from the chemicals, but nothing that signified uh, uh, an environmental impact that was worrisome. And of course, we reported on all this to uh, the Ithaca populace um, on an annual basis. And uh, the Bolton Water, the Bolton Point Water Treatment Plant and Drinking Water Plant is just up the lake, about three miles on the east shore. And working with the Department of Health, um, they they did regular testing to make sure that no remnants of these chemicals ever reached that water. Next slide. I think this is yeah, this is just one more. So uh, you know, by 2015, 2016, we were feeling kind of good. Um, 
Bob Johnson had gotten down to not being able to find any tubers in Cuga Inlet, which meant that the treatments had been effective. Not only was hydrilla not growing, but there was nothing left in the sediment for it to grow again the next year. So the timing of treatments had been done correctly, and it seemed like we were winning. But, you know, we've got this, um, you know, 30-something mile lake with people moving in boats all around. Um, and bringing in boats from other places. Um, so it just seemed a matter of time. And so, you know, it was constantly like, yay, we seem to be winning, but. Um, so I'm sort of setting the stage here for the next slide, <laughs> please. Oh uh, yeah, this is a photo of um, our fabulous team of experts um, working in um, Fall Creek hand harvesting hydrilla because that the Fall Creek was, it moves rapidly enough that the, uh, the granular um, form of the Floridone wasn't staying around long enough to have any impact on the plants. It was just washing out into the lake. And so uh, the team said, well, we've just got to knock back the growth during the growing season. So they went out and hand harvested it, but that was just a, a temporary solution. And that area there, that's between Stewart Park and the golf course, if you know the area, remains problematic to this day. They were putting down um, a lot of benthic mats last year um, to try to um, prevent the resurgent hydrilla there from um, growing further. Next slide, please. And so this is our public outreach. We did an awful lot of tabling. For many years, we were a fixture at the Ithaca Farmer's Market, the, the charming little hydrilla table. Um, next slide, please. Yep, there, there we are in a later incarnation at the Ithaca Farmer's Market. We were at every event and we did workshops and we started working with Cayuga County very, very early. Well, Michelle Wonderlich was all over this instantly and you guys were just wonderful to work with. Next slide, please. And we started workshops to train the public to recognize and report hydrilla, not to pull it out yourself because that's just going to make a mess. It's going to break off and float away. Um, but here's on board um, Bill Foster in the floating classroom. You know, you put out a, a vat of stuff that you've pulled out of the lake and everybody sorts through it and um, learns how to find what is and is not hydrilla. Next slide, please. And then um, uh, we had a, a talented, the Cuga Lake Watershed Network had a talented graphic artist type intern, Ashley. And she developed this really great little uh, Hydrilla Hunters logo, you see, with the, you know, magnifying glass spotting the serrations on the leaves. And uh, that became our logo for an uh, online newsletter, Hydrilla Hunter Happenings, that we continue to put out several times every summer and um, got us going on really, really developing a cadre of people uh, to work on this, first around the south end of the lake and then lake wide. Next slide, please. Yep, here's Ashley posing. Um, back in that ancient day, we made hydrilla identification um, by drying hydrilla in plant presses. This is uh, Sharon Anderson's idea, and then laminating it. So uh, this is, we called this the classic in later years as DEC and then the Finger Lakes Prism came up with much better, handier, easier to share, create, and reproduce ways of identifying hydrilla. But that's, you know, Ashley posing with a decidedly non-hydrilla plant, um, comparing it to see if it, you know, matched. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. This is a slightly goofy picture of, this is, uh, that's Bill Foster of the floating classroom on the right there, I think wondering, what am I doing here with these young persons? Um, this is a, a cadre of, of DEC trained um, young persons who were going from lake to lake teaching at public events and workshops about um, invasive species. And so I met up with them when we did a hydrilla tabling at a bass fishing tournament in Union Springs. 
which again is an audience that is not completely sympathetic to people wanting to inspect boats because there they are you know having to get in and out of the lake in a hurry and go to other places and rush around and try to catch fish you know tournament and um here we are saying we'd like to check your boat please so you know um next slide and then i come to one of our great heroes that's dave heck and his wife joyce and dave uh started listening to all this in 2011 2012 and he and Joyce spent 2012 driving up and down every road around Cuba Lake, figuring out where they could put in an information dispenser about hydrilla. And then he built them all and installed them all. And then he started asking me for those classic hydrilla uh, laminated things and newer versions and we came up with a flyer to go with it and before you knew it he and Joyce had set up I think it was like 40 to start at every marina restaurant park landing that was nominally public around all of Cuba Lake and they spent <clears throat> from 2012 to I don't know 2015 or 2016 when as he put it father time began to catch up with him um, but he's still with us, um, spending their summers doing that. And, um, you know, he, 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 and he kept track of it. So there, you know, 600, 800 people a summer taking those kits and we hope learning something from them. Um, they, they were fabulous. And as he started to pull back from being quite so actively involved, we, we, we took over, called it Dave's team. And Jen here um, helped run that and is still working with the Finger Lakes Institute staff and interns uh, to do this. We're, Jen, next slide, <laughs> please. Here's um, an in, our intern Carly in 2018 on the West Shore, setting up one of Dave's um, flyers uh, dispensers for the summer. Next slide, please. There's Jen and Carly at the North End Marina, um, putting in another one. Dave had negotiated these sites with all of these people and he'd made so many friends for us. And they, you know, would say, uh oh, where's Dave? When we would show up and we'd say, don't worry, he's still around, but we're just helping him out a little. Okay, next slide, please. And then this is Lynn Leopold. She helped put in um, another 15, 20 sites around the South End in Ithaca. Um, and she does all that every summer for us now. And also the Finger Lakes Institute staff and interns are helping. And um, our North End resident, Tom Casella, covers a whole bunch of sites around the North End of the lake. And the Abel family on the Southwest Shore have also helped. Next slide, please. And then we went in for uh, lake rakes, um, weed rakes, you know, those kind of heavy two-headed two lake uh, rake contraptions that you can throw out and haul in from your dock or a sturdy boat. And um, if you know what you're looking for, you know, find out if you've got hydrilla off your dock. And um, we have several models of these now um available for um anybody who is willing to commit to checking on a regular basis um next slide please and then we have paul Kloss. this is a, a talented ithaca paddler who's a real community organizer type guy and he realized yeah, he does stand up paddle boards and kayaking and you can't have one of those big heavy lake rakes on that so he devised um, those small little baby rakes. So he's got ropes here that he put on them um, so that people could toss them off a kayak or standing up on a paddle board and check the nooks and crannies around the edge of the lake for hydrilla, which is where it um, lurks. Next slide, please. And this was, um, we'd, we'd started, Bob Johnson and others had found right out there, um, a big new patch, many acres in extent in 
Cayuga Inlet after we thought we'd gotten rid of it in 2018, 2019. And they were going out part of a team of about seven paddlers to look for other um, pieces, other uh, areas along the shore there. Next slide, please. And uh, this is a wonderful Wells intern who went door to door in Aurora because Aurora turned out to have a major infestation um, off the dock there, about 130 acres. That was discovered in 2016, 2017, around the time that it was found that Don's Marina down in King Ferry also had an infestation. And just before it was discovered that the marina in um, uh, Lansing, had the, the inner marina was completely choked with hydrilla. So I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, next slide, please. That's my dog, she -Ra. And then partners. There's Michelle. I warned her this morning I'd put her in this. Michelle Wonderlick, as you all know, is uh, just fabulous ally, so smart so well organized and so kind. And she started doing aquatic invasive species workshops and working with us and all of you and a lot of other people um, very early in this. Um, next slide, please. And um, this, is a, this was a good meeting. This was at Wells. And this was when we were starting to realize, you know, this isn't a South End problem anymore. Um, this is lake wide. And um, started reaching out in a comprehensive way all around the lake, trying to get people to come and talk together back when we met in person, as we will again, and um, try to figure out how to handle this. Uh, you know, because we got, Cougar Lake has 46 municipalities, you know, and three major counties, not just on the shoreline and more in the uplands. Uh, in the watershed. So it's a real problem to, to, to unify people. And I started by uh, having um, monthly phone calls, around the lake phone calls, just a conference call, just to talk to people, to get people used to talking to each other from all of these counties. And I think some friendships were formed then that have blossomed since as this kind of thing has gotten easier. And uh, next slide, please. And then along comes Finger Lakes PRISM. And man, uh, PRISM stands for, I always have to read this, Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. And Finger Lakes Institute in Geneva with uh, Lisa Kleckner as the executive director uh, managed to land um, having the Finger Lakes PRISM, it's part of a statewide network uh, at, at her institute. And Hillary Mosier, instantly brought so much expertise, attention, and some funding uh, to guide us in how to communicate with the public and how to look for hydrilla. It was uh, just wonderful. Next slide. And then here's uh, Lisa, <laughs> Lisa Kleckner, uh, her back to us, um, standing next to uh, Senator Chuck Schumer in spring 2017 when there was some political wrangling going on with the new administration as to whether or not um, various forms of funding would be released. And Chuck was just darn resolved that we were gonna get that hydrilla federal funding. And he <laughs> flew, you know, flew and drove to uh, reassure us of this. And he even Lisa gave him little bags of hydrilla to uh, hold up. I don't have that photo, of, alas. Uh, so, the partners were wonderful and the Finger Lakes Prism, wow. Um, next slide, please. And you know, one of the one of the things that all of the lake groups have been working on since then is the water stewards program. Um, your lakes are are well equipped with them, and Cayuga Lake is fortunate that we are assigned several each year for um various spots. This is at the south end at Ithaca at the Treeman Marine Park. And um, last year, a new one was added at Mudlock at the north end. So we, and there are several in between. And they give information, they do inspections it, it, on a voluntary basis. And they're just great ambassadors. And they managed to continue during the pandemic in a limited way, which was great. Next slide, please. 
And then public awareness. This is something that people around Ithaca got kind of surly about. Um, there, there ended up being those little yellow notification signs. This water has been treated with for hydrilla, you know, at 75 foot intervals by law. And this kind of made some people grumpy, but at the same time, hey, people, you're being informed. And this is at um, the Aurora site. Uh, next slide, please. You can see the yellow, <laughs> I think I captured three of the yellow notification signs here. Um, this is at uh, the Ithaca Farmer's Market. Uh, next slide. Yep. These are beautiful signs. I craved one. Um, this is in Ithaca as well. Next slide, please. And then this is a little sloppier, but this is a public notice uh, board in Aurora. And, you know, lots of information there. Uh, that's Solitude on the upper right. That's the main chemical company that's been helping with the treatments and applying. And, and that's their uh, schedule to tell Aurora when we'll be here. And uh, hydrilla, hydrilla management program um, information. So letting the public know what's going on, trying to be as transparent as possible. Next slide, please. And then this is, uh, I've got those dots down there are supposed to be sort of dun 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 dots of doom. Hydrilla's reemergence at the South End, 2018 to 2020. Paul Kloss went out on his paddleboard. He found Hydrilla uh, at the south Southwest end of the lake where it hadn't been found before. And that was um, about the same time she's holding that hydrilla. And that was about the same time that that new big chunk was found in Cuga Inlet. And those other sites showed up, well, first Aurora, then Don's Marina, and then the uh, marina in um, Lansing. Next slide, please. And the... <laughs> The discovery of the infestation at Don, at uh, the marina in Lansing um, was just prior to a 48 or 72 hour fishing tournament and, you know, 24 hours a day. So we all bit the bullet and we were there all night just to make sure that we talk to any fishermen going in or out and say, please be aware of this problem. Please make sure your boat is clean. We, could, we weren't trying to restrict or control anybody just to make sure they understood that, that, that there was a problem. That's Roxy Johnston there on the night shift. Next slide, please. And this is the Finger Lakes Institute. They lucked out and got the day shift. Um, and so we, we greeted and informed everybody in that tournament. Okay, next slide. And then, um, so by 2019, 2020, we were letting the public know that there were basically four areas that, that uh, map there is uh, missing its red dots, but we, we got um, information out to the public, you know, with a big glowing red dot for the South End, which had become reinfested with hydrilla or it was just emerging from places that had been hiding. And then up the East shore at Don's Marina, Aurora and in Lansing. And this one, well, I've, I've got, this is our handout that went with our hydrilla ID kits in all of those boxes around the lake. Um, but what was the great disappointment to me and maybe to Jen, um, that those new sites, you know, the Sailing Center, Don's Marina, Finger Lakes Marina, um, they all had hydrilla information signs, ID kits, and how to report information on hand right there, right where the customer comes in and goes out right at the dock, but nobody was using that information. And so those, those you know, plants were probably brought, undoubtedly brought in on boats from up and down the lake and dropped and flourished. And everybody must have just figured somebody else is paying attention. So we realized there was a real limitation on how much value the public was or hydrilla protection was getting from all of those boxes of information that we were so industriously putting out every summer. Next slide, please. This is um, our last in-person 
um, for the time being. Um, end of season um, Hydrilla public reporting session. We've been holding these every fall since 2012, 2012. And um, this one was at Wells College. They've been at other places and it's a great opportunity for members of the public, students, um, and all of the community of experts and volunteers who have been working on this now for a number of years to get together, talk in person, compare notes. And uh, it's a, almost scholarly, but has very good refreshments too. And uh, I hope, hope we can have more in-person gatherings. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here's a conventional slide for you. We've got a new hydrilla management era emerging in 2021. This is um, a little bit uh, because people had a little bit of extra time last year in the pandemic, uh, but it's also we're really excited that uh, DEC has stepped forward and said, we're going to help a little bit more. And we're all, they're, they're paying attention to, see that first thing there is a draft white paper. Um, Roxy Johnston of Ithaca, with me kind of helping, uh, put together a longitudinal report on everything I've been telling you, but with all of the reports in it, all of the science, all of the background, all of the scholarly documentation, all of the info about hydrilla as a problem around the world, you know, um, and everything that's been done in Cuga Lake and the problem of lack of funding for monitoring, for treatment, having to go find money every single year or every other year to try to keep this at bay when we feel so responsible for, you know, preventing it from spreading to elsewhere. And DEC um, got a little bit ahead of us. We just gotten a draft out and boom, they announced last fall that they had a draft hydrilla management plan for Cuba Lake. And this is going to be, um, I only know the Cuba Lake details, okay, but I understand that they're ramping up to do this statewide. So uh, there will be um, teams, strike teams, there will be a lot more monitoring, oversight, and work done by DEC, working with the Finger Lakes Institute, which is just great. Um, and, uh, but this also means that our little cult light group at the south end of Cuga Lake and working with you guys and Department of Health and Cuga and Tompkins counties um, will continue. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers got involved in 2016 and have been helping with funding for treatment um, at the Aurora site and are now going to be doing the treatment um, oversight and management for the south end of the lake this summer and all of the entities including Bob Johnson, um, Roxy, Bill Foster and the gang uh, will we'll continue to have a role. So I, I think it's uh, pretty uh, masterful and I, I hope the funding is there so that we can eradicate and not manage. Okay, next slide please. And in 2020, I just want to say that we did manage to continue everything, as you probably found. You can get a lot done even if you can't, you know, have to wear a mask and stay, stay apart from one another. We got the ID kits around the lake. We supplemented that by having people volunteer with the Finger Lakes Institute's um, God, vegetation, aquatic vegetation survey. I'll call it that. I forget the official name. Um, and kayakers from the Finger Lakes Institute checked our shorelines on a regular basis. Um, and this is a lake rake demonstration. We, we got on board the uh, Discover Cuga Lakes beautiful vessel. That's the floating classroom today. Um, sorting through looking for hydrilla. Next slide, please. And we even had a fall community conference at the end of the year, although this one was online. Um, and it's on our uh, YouTube channel that Jen and I developed during the pandemic. So we adapted and our program survived, but unfortunately Hydrilla is also doing quite well. So um, 
there will be treatment this summer. There will be monitoring. DEC and Finger Lakes Institute are stepping up, and um, we're all just sort of going to see how this all works out. But I think it's um, going to be good. Um, next slide, please. And this is the Cuba Lake Hydrilla Management Plan. I'm resorting to, to screenshots for these um, documents because that's everybody's online right now. Um, and it'll mean better integrated and funded hydrilla monitoring and control. And, and we, the Cuba Lake Watershed Network, will have a continued role doing the public outreach around the lake, which is really great. And others at the South End and the Army Corps will continue to participate. Next slide, please. Yep. This kind of scary looking creature here. This is um, the Finger Lakes Institute's new um, hydrilla monster. Uh, that's their poster there. Um, and they're going to be using, they've, they've developed a whole new um, campaign for hydrilla across the Finger Lakes. So I think you're gonna be seeing this uh, slightly scary creature um, on billboards. And um, they've, you know, worked with a consultant to try to update um, the, the, the way we were, we and other local groups have been talking about hydrilla. So, you know, this is uh, an interesting, you know, treating hydrilla as a kind of criminal here, aggressive waterway invasion and so on. And we'll, we'll see how this goes. I kind of like it. I've got a whole bunch of these posters if anybody wants one. Um, and if you'd like um, more information, it's available at our website right on the front page. You can click and watch uh, last fall's hydrilla presentations and more information on our YouTube channel. And then, of course, uh, Finger Lakes Institute PRISM has got a whole lot of stuff about hydrilla. So Jen and I thank you. And uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Are there questions? Let's see. Lori, this is Dana. May I lead off with a question? Yes, please do. Um, so you uh, you mentioned several times hand harvesting. Uh, how literally is that done? Get, given that this plant breaks into small segments and they float away and so on and so on. Well, they were that that group that you saw on Fall Creek that one time. They were uh -huh. doing that. Um, harvesting just as a way to get the biomass reduced during the summer months so that it would not break off and float out into the lake with the heavy flow coming down Fall Creek from um, above. Um, but that is not recommended. They, they were really just kind of desperate because they'd done the recommended chemical treatments, but the water was flowing too fast and was just being flushed past the plants. And uh, so that was limited. Um, and it's not, it's not, in fact, I mean, that's, that's why, you know, at the very beginning we were all, oh boy, we're going to train volunteers how to find hydrilla and then they'll go out and tromp around and get it all. And California and Florida said, no, 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 no. It breaks off a quarter inch of it is enough to root and start a new hydrilla empire. And uh, you mustn't let people do this. It has to be done by experts. So, you know, we, we tried out, um, we, I mean the team, the group, um, tried out, um, they found some relatively isolated <coughs> in the Southeast corner of the lake, right off of Stewart Park. And um, they tried all of the kind of um, non-chemical treatment methods there because they were good shallow water, easy to get to, um, not disturbed by a lot of traffic. And so first they got um, divers. I mean, the water was only about four feet deep, but they got divers, put plastic fencing around it. There wasn't a lot of flow, so it was fairly safe to do it that way. And then had those guys go on down in there into the sediment and dig 
and try to see if they could get the tubers out that way. And it didn't work very well. It, it just, there was too much potential for breakage and floating and escape. And it was extremely labor intensive and very inaccurate. And so then um, those sites proved quite amenable to putting down benthic mats, which are, you know, um, designed to put a little bit of weight on the plants to basically smother them and to prevent light from getting through. And they did that there for several years at those sites and found it was effective for those plants, but then darn it, there were other hydrilla plants coming up a couple of hundred yards away. So, you know, um, yeah. So no, hand harvesting doesn't do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question from Dr. Boyer, Greg Boyer. Um, Greg, I think you're on. Do you want to read your own question or I can for you? Oh, sorry, no mic. So um, as you can maybe see, Hillary, on the chat box, um, he's asking, how soon in the spring do you see the plants develop, or is this a late summer issue? Right. That's not it. This was uh, interesting. We learned this through sort of what happened on Cuba Lake as opposed to what happens elsewhere in different climate conditions. Because, you know, they were, we were going at first on what happens in California and Florida. And um, Bob Johnson actually would be able to tell you this with extreme detail. But um, I think he was a little horrified last year. The plants came up a lot sooner than he expected in 2020. Uh, things are seem to be a little warmer and um, they're coming up sooner. So um, let's see. So the emergent plants, the first chemical treatment this summer will be uh, late June, early July. Um, but they really, you know, what the, what the plants do makes them so successful is they emerge and then they creep along the bottom and grow a lot. And then uh, as the water warms, um, they shoot up to the surface in later summer. And then they start to fill the water column and branch out. <laughs> and uh, they are around until nowadays until November or December. Bob has seen them flourishing in clear water near the end of the year. So, um, it's a problem. And, mm -hmm. you know, and if, if you knock them back with, if you didn't knock them back, of course, they would, you know, freeze and drop to the bottom to some extent. But over a number of years, if you let that happen, which is what happened at these various marinas and in Aurora, <laughs> you've got a roaring community coming up first thing um, in June starting to creep a little bit and then by mid-July um, becoming really problematic. Yes, bald eagles. Yes, uh, we, ball, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at that one there. Have I heard about the news that in the South, bald eagles are getting poisoned by a toxin from a cyanobacterium that grows on hydrilla. Yes, um, uh, this, this swept through the Tompkins County Legislature last week, and um, it was uh, ne needful for our team to reassure them that no bromide is involved in the herbicides that are used. Um, but if you look at that, you know, and you start thinking about cyanobacterium, harmful algal blooms, bald eagles, hydrilla, that's a very alarming combination. So we're, we're all going to have to think carefully through all the pieces of that and figure out what to do about it. How expensive is the chemical treatment? I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers here, but um, it's uh, when Aurora, the, the village of Aurora discovered that they had 130 acres of hydrilla off of their shores, um, they were kind of alarmed. Um, but the Army Corps of Engineers um, 
which does, uh, they call these experimental plots to see if they can come up with effective treatments with minimal chemical use. Um, they, they offered to, to take on the cost of treatment there. And um, I'm sorry, I'm just not, I'm blanking on the numbers, but they're readily available and anybody who wants to know, I'm happy to share. No, nobody yet, no, no town or community yet on Cayuga Lake has had to bear the full costs. This has been either dealt with by state funding, um, Army Corps calling us experiments, um, and having federal funding and um, um, other other uh, grant grant funding so far. And Figure Lakes Institute uh, has had the funding to do the treatment at uh, the Lansing site and at Don's Marina. Oh, and I forgot Don's Marina. There was. I, I, if you've been there, it's a small little enclosed dock area and hydrilla was growing um, right where boats would tend to uh, pull up to get gas and so on. And so they did another um, non-chemical treatment test there. They dredged it, but you know, dredging's a problem because what do you do with the spoil that has hydrilla in it? You got to treat it very carefully. Um, but the dredging didn't do the trick. It, it came back. So they ended up having to use um, fluoridone and uh, the copper uh, treatments there as well. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, uh, a bit earlier, Janet Lehman asked, um, you've touched on this a little bit, but is hydrilla a factor in blue-green algae blooms? Um, is So... Can you go into that a bit more? Is it the rotting biomass that provides the nutrients that are needed that the cyanobacteria then flourishes or how does it work? That I don't know. That I don't know. I, that's something I think we all need to educate ourselves about this summer. I suspect they know a lot about this in the South where hydrilla has been around a lot longer and um, Harmful algal blooms are endemic and, and long lasting. This is something that's uh, really just sort of occurring to us might be a real problem on Cuba Lake. Okay, Dr. Boyer, uh, Hillary, maybe you can see, points out to oh, the second, uh, second, second largest source of bromide, coal-fired power plants, dang. Well, you know, they aren't, um, they, they've, the Cayuga power plant has uh, quit, um, quit, yeah, burning coal. Um, they're looking for <laughs> other sources of revenue for that site and to redevelop it. And um, are the chemicals, but, but you know, there, there may be some still leachate coming off of the landfill there, which has yet to be dealt with. Um, Okay, are the chemicals used to treat hydrilla harmful to swimmers? Not in the amounts presently in use. Um, I, I noted that there's no swimming or drinking water restrictions uh, for the current levels of use, like in Aurora. Um, but there is um, irrigation restriction when, when fluoridone's in use. And there, there are some places upslope of Aurora that do use irrigation and the great lawns at the hotel there. So they have to consider that. There, there was a time when um, this was all just getting going uh, in Cuga Inlet in Ithaca, when that 166 acres had to be dealt with, that the chemical concentrations were high enough that people were asked to stay out of the water for a day. And people were asked not to boat and just let, let the stuff make its way through the system before it dissipated and broke up in the lake and long-term has had very little impact. But that, that, hasn't, that restriction hasn't been in use for a number, number of years. Any other questions, um, anyone for Hillary related to hydrilla and the long-term campaign? And I guess a question, another question, if I may, from, from me, obviously, is um, is hydrilla winning the, the war, do you think? Or uh, what's your, what's your um, assessment of that? Um, well, I've got this good old motto 
from environmental activism is they can't win if you don't quit, which you guys know a lot about in Aula. Um, but the problem is it takes everybody around the lake being engaged, you know, um, and, and that's a real challenge. We, we started a, uh, Jed and I put together a, a new email list last summer of all of the municipalities around the lake. There's 19 of them on the shoreline. We don't, we don't really have the, you know, really well integrated communications and organization that you guys have got lake wide. And uh, so we're making sure to let them know, you know, this isn't just an Ithaca problem anymore. This is something that could show up on your shoreline and could cause a real problem. So please, you know, pay attention when we send you information and uh, we'd love it if, well, Finger Lakes Institute has got this program training people to monitor along a stretch of the lake the way they do for harmful algal blooms but this is for a variety of plants including hydrilla and uh i think they said that over 20 people from Cuba lake signed up to do that this year so that's a real good start any other questions anyone uh, 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 jim go ahead please dana um, if there aren't any other questions on hydrilla, I would love to hear um, Hillary's comments on the uh, manure spill if uh, she hasn't. So, well, but, uh, if there are other questions about hydrilla, then do that. Hillary, can we impose on you for a few more minutes of your time? Um, any insight? Uh, the newspaper in Auburn reported 100,000 gallons of liquid manure had gone down the creek. Uh, I don't think it said whether any actually reached the lake. Um, has the creek itself or the brook or whatever it's called uh, somehow been cleaned up? And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm taking your time. Well, I, I, I love this conversation across from, from Wasco Lake drainage to the Cuba Lake drainage. Um, you guys have been fierce warriors about this problem for a long time now. We're way behind you. You are our model for how to do it. And so I'm really delighted to talk to you. Um, Dave, Dave Eckhart's on this call, on this uh, Zoom, I notice. And he is, he and Rebecca Ruggles, who lives uh, in the Aurora area, and uh, Julie Dickinson, did I get the name right? Dinosaur Dry Goods is her moniker, um, contacted me about this. Um, and I was struck by the fact that it was, you know, three individuals who, who were just saying, hey, we heard something, what do you know? And I thought, you know, that's really not the way this should happen. Um, just somebody hearing talk. Um, and so I contacted uh, Adam Effler and asked him, do you know anything about it? Because he's one of my gods. And uh, he said, uh, we haven't heard about this one. Um, this, you know, if, if, if this in fact happened, he said, you know, I mean, this is the point we're at. Um, it should have been reported to DEC, but we don't know if it was. And at this point, another person in this conversation, TN Hunter with the um, uh, Cayuga Lake Watershed Intermunicipal Organization, um, said she had just happened to be in Aurora and had heard people talking about this. And she said, was this reported to DEC? And learned that it had. See, she, she sort of knew what should happen when this sort of thing takes place. And so she contacted DEC and got the number of the person who was handling it. And so then I in turn sent this information back to Dave to Rebecca and to Dickinson. And um, they all resolved between the three of them to contact that DEC number and uh, say, you know, we're concerned about this as representatives of various community organizations in the area. So, you know, I thought, well, this is a good first step. And then about a day later, I heard from, um, Steve Penningroth and Nate Lawner at the Community Science Institute in Ithaca because they they have a we have 
a group of volunteers who do regular water quality testing four times a year on Great Gully and various other streams in that stretch. And um, Nate and Steve had heard about this incident and talked it over with the samplers. And it turned out that those samplers were going to be doing a sampling along the creek, along Great Gully Creek uh, that week. So I'm sorry, I'm getting my times mixed up here, but it would have been within, I think a week of the spill. No, maybe two weeks of the spill, okay? And so um, that would have been a f sometime last week that they did the sampling. Yeah, I'm not sure about the timing on this, but anyway, we're waiting to see what the results are, to see what, might have been left of that spill still coming down through the creek system at that time. So maybe we'll get some indication of it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't DEC say that they're imposing some kinds of um, fines or something on the perpetrator? Well, uh, according to the newspaper article, yes. Uh, but you know, what really happened and how much really was released and how much cleanup was really done and um, so on and so on. Uh, we're, we're trying to do a little homework and figure that out be, before we decide uh, to take further action. Well, we I, I would love to work with you on that and learn how you do this, okay? Because um, this, this has not been our area of greatest strength is going after these kinds of incidents. Uh, what, what we have been doing on Cuga Lake is with, this is in Seneca County, Northwest shoreline. We have some very talented, um, um, dogged people up there, like you guys, Bill Ebert and Tom Casella, and they've been doing water quality testing on four, heavily agricultural creeks up on the Northwest shoreline for five years now. And we finally had enough data in which all the numbers were bright red for phosphorus and sediment and uh, E. coli coming out of these creeks for five consecutive years and made a report to the Seneca County Board of Supervisors about two or three weeks ago. So that'll tell you I know where you guys are at. You're way ahead of us on this, years ahead. But we we took that report to a, you know, a seriously agricultural part of the watershed and said, look, um, this isn't acceptable. And um, that same team has just started a new study um, working with SUNY ESF um, this past week, monitoring at the mouths of seven or eight creeks in Seneca and Cuga counties, um, looking um, to take um, not just water quality samples and stormwater samples, but to do some DNA testing of the bacteria to determine who's doing the pooping. So, uh, you know, cattle, humans, birds, for example. And that, that study, as long as it rains enough for the creeks to flow this summer, will really yield some fantastic results about um, the, the true sources of some of these problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I'd, I'd love to, whatever you are talking about doing as next steps, um, I, and I'm not, I can't speak for Dave Eckhart there, but I know that Rebecca Ruggles and some others would, would, would really like to work with you on this. I mean, they're yeah. members of our organization, but they're not really activists in the way you guys are, but that can change. Well, we're in, we're in the uh, data gathering mode right now, which can't go on too much longer, but want to make sure we have our facts as straight as possible. Okay, well, I, then I think my first step is to contact the guys at uh, who accepted the lab um, who accept the water quality samples from Great Gully and ask them if, if they could, uh, you know, get results to us uh, sooner than later. 
No, that would be that'd be appreciated. That'd be Steve Pennington, probably, I guess. And yes, yeah, Steve Penningroth and Nate. Uh, oh, anyway. Yes, that'd, that'd be wonderful, Hillary. Um, it's coming up on the uh, half hour past. Any other questions or discussions? Anything? We've got Hillary trapped right now. So, anything else we want to ask her? I'm going to renew my membership. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but Hil Hillary, this is Jim Beckwith. Also in your contacts, make sure you contact the farmers. There are a lot of very good farmers out yes. there and, and uh, uh, they're willing to work and uh, have been working with us much, much more uh, readily and, and going forward. And we all have more work to do, but uh, make sure you, you bring them in the loop. Oh yeah, I, 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 you, you are the model in how to do this. Um, so, I think the- And also Hillary, also thank you so much for your presentation um, on the hydrilla and I'm sorry to intertwine this other, but there are people out in our organization that would kind of like to know a little bit about the manure spill. So thank you. Great. And yes, thank, uh, thanks so much, Jen, for, for yeah. being there. Hillary, thank thank you, um, thank your thank your attendant. I've lost your name here. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, thanks, uh, Jen. Thanks for giving us uh, a wonderful, fact-filled history of the battle you've been uh, waging against Hydrilla. And um, if there are no other questions, we'll let you get on with what remains of your evening. Thank you very much. Thank so you. going once, twice. Yeah. All right, then. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Great job. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.